Welcome to Once More With Feeling, Eat The Elephant, newest album from A Perfect Circle. Their first album in 14 years! For the rest of the Just world, Just slightly that's, longer. Well, I was going to say, for the rest of the world, that's closer to like 3,000 years and change. <laughs> it's It feels like it's been at least that long. I swear to God, I was actually, not even a twinkle in my dad's eye when the, when their last album came out, I actually think that Copernicus was walking around. <laughs> <laughs> or uh, Rome just got sacked. I think that's the last time they actually released an album. Attila the Hun was happily young and uh, young and had a tearful eye as he was looking at all the women he could have sex with. I think so, that's when they were last doing something. So yeah, that's actually sl ever so slightly longer than the last Tool album came out. And supposedly that's coming out this year as well. So we'll find I, out. How, but... Really? They're going to release it? Okay, so Maynard has finally gone, alright guys, so like, I've been so bored for the last 14, 13, 12-ish years, other than my couple times where I was on a couple TV shows, that like, I'm going to get both bands together, and we're going to just dive in like, whole hog and totally kick ass and take names. Um, <laughs> Tool, 2016! Uh, that's eight, two, 2018. 2016! <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> Apparently, that's what's going on. I mean, but yeah, wow. so um, going into this album, uh, where to begin? Uh, well, first things first, if you don't know A Perfect Circle, they're basically a supergroup formed from various new metal artists. Um, the best way to describe these guys is you have Maynard from from Tool along with what is it? It's his guitar player, right? Uh, Billy Howard guitar player is the one that came over. Uh, Billy Howardell from Ashes Divide. I thought it was. I thought he was. Oh, never mind. But yeah, basically you've got a pretty heavy list. Like their first two first two albums they released were kind of Tool light, where they weren't quite as tribal in their sound, where it was repetitive and grindy and whatnot. But it still had a lot of his same thematic as far as for themes of music style and his his vocals were very similar to the way that they were in Tool. So you had the Tool feel of the deep music, uh, deep melody and whatnot, mm. but it wasn't just so ridiculously repetitive like Tool tends to be. Mm. You know, they weren't 14 minute tracks. Instead, they were usual three to five minute tracks on average. So it felt more like an actual traditional band rather than like Tool, which is just you want to basically pop the album on and sit back and drink some alcohol and just relax and just close your eyes and listen to it and kind of just let your mind that's pretty much and kind of that's just pretty much play my... almost like a version of fantasia in your head yeah yeah that's tool that's tool with the, right there so yeah hey, tool. but a perfect circle ends up being i would call it a more traditional style band than tool because you end up with you know your your three to five minute tracks, so that way you're not on these ridiculously long benders where they just keep going and going and going. The music doesn't necessarily go from one song to the next as the same song, like you saw with para, uh, para, uh, para, para, parable, par, parabola, yeah, and parable and parabola. So that you don't see that like you did like you did with the Tool. So. Its music is much better off one-off. So if you were to hear it on the radio, you wouldn't feel like, crap, I only got to hear half the song. Instead, you actually get to hear each song individually. And as a result, it's much better in small doses than its counterpart. It's Because Tool doesn't work as one-offs. Yeah, It's kind of like... Um... Oh, this is where I sound really like a massive music geek here. But if you're familiar with Porcupine Tree and Blackfield. Blackfield is basically a more standard form of music structure, and it's similar sort of feel there. And right. Sorry. Uh, You're bringing up bands I've never heard of before. <laughs> porcupine, <laughs> porcupine Tree are kind of... Are, is, okay, I have to ask, is that a Piers Anthony joke right there? That feels like that belongs in the world of Xanth, which now I'm becoming a fucking book nerd. No, I know, I know Piers Anthony. Huh? I've got the whole series, so 
Yeah, I mean, that, that, that sounds like it belongs in, in one of his books, where it's like, okay, it's a pun, and the pun now is a real-life thing, like the infant tree, which is a tree covered in infant soldiers that will then jump off the tree and stab you in the face! I'm going to That's look... That's what that feels like it comes from. I'm gonna look this up. Uh... I swear to God, that sounds like something that belongs in a Piers Anthony book. Hooray! We're now even more geeky than we were beforehand! Hooray! No one will ever listen to us. We've officially turned off any future viewers with this opening. Hooray! Eat the Elephant, brought to you by Piers Anthony, apparently. <laughs> Jesus Christ, what the hell happened to us? I don't know! We started out so shittily, we're gonna end up even worse. Okay, let's get off this track. Let's yeah. get off this track. Go back to what we were originally talking yeah. about before we end up in a tangent where we start talking about, like, Antelopes and Barry Manilow somehow. Let's quickly go back to something yeah. that's actually we're talking about. Yeah, going back to a perfect circle. So, yeah, they've heard various members from um, Smashing Pumpkins. Um, now, are we talking about the Razor from Smashing Pumpkins? Because I hear that he was doing really good for a while. Um, uh, you know, like the, the nice gleaming, all the red flo flowing blood from the Smashing Pumpkins. Uh, I'm not saying they were suicidal, I'm just saying that they were suicidal. Um, I'm talking uh, Billy Corgan from Smashing Pumpkins was part of them. Um, Fine. Mm. Be honest and sincere versus being a douchebag like myself. Well, I, I didn't get the joke, so... It's okay, I don't think anyone will. That was a pretty shitty joke mm. at that, so... Oh, okay. Okay, apparently not. Apparently I'm talking bullshit, but... Oh, well. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Oh. All right, you know that time when uh, when Rush was part of Perfect Circle? Rush was great. They joined them for like seven or eight concerts. They went out there, they played uh, Mr. Obato, and you know all the times that they went out there. They they even did the 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 theme of Goldeneye. Like they were they were just an amazing band out there for those kids. And <laughs> what the fuck are we doing? I don't know. I always feel like we should. <laughs> Shall we restart this whole thing? No, no, just just keep this in. Let the people out there wonder at this point what the hell's going on. Let's just start talking about the album. Let's start to, stop talking about the past of um, A Perfect Circle, because the past doesn't matter so much as the future. So let's talk about the future and what they've done. Right. Or so, at least the present and what they've done. Right, so I'll just discuss the personnel on the album. Uh, obviously, you've got Maynard on vocals. You've got Billy Howdell on guitar, bass, and keyboards. Uh, for a good chunk of it. Um, you've got Matt Majunkins on bass on By and Down the River and Feathers. Uh, he is former touring bassist for Eagles of Death Metal, also worked with 30 Seconds to Mard, Ashes Divide, Pussifier, and so 30 Socardia. Seconds to Mars. Huh? 30 Seconds to Mars, not 30 Seconds to Mard. I thought I said 30 Seconds to Mars. You said 30 Seconds to Mard. And I didn't want to cackle maniacally into the microphone. I just wanted to correct that nice and simply. <laughs> so for those of you out there who actually enjoy 30 Seconds to Mars, they're now been renamed to 30 Seconds of Mard. <laughs> it's kind of like mulp. It's another one of those words that just won't ever go away. For those of you who have never heard of the joke about mulp, I don't know which of these two reviews is going to go out first, either this or another review where we kind of talk about YouTube drama. I don't know which is going to happen first, but yeah, hopefully you've heard that one before this. It depends on how fast I can get these edited and Edmund can get it edited and we can get these uploaded. Mm. So lots of inside jokes for people who've probably never heard it. Yes! So, um, continuing on with the band lined up. And lined up? Line up. <laughs> I, I've, I'm the one that's been drinking and I'm doing better. Good damn. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> this Xanax, this Xanax is so good right now. Just kidding, I don't take Xanax. I need to make it very clear that the stumbling in my words has nothing to do with the drugs I haven't taken. <laughs> and you've got Jeff Friedel on drums. I don't. It doesn't have a link for him, so I don't know if he's been in any other bands or anything like that. Watch, he's actually like the, he's like probably like the lead guitarist for some really important band that we just don't happen to know right this exact second. We're very sorry if we fucked that up. We, we really love you. We love you. Have our baby. Or can we have your baby? One of those two. <laughs> Sex must be involved. Anyway, going on to the album proper. So... This is a bit of a tricky album to tackle because... Think of it like a 12-step program from hell. Because <laughs> it's 12 steps. There's 12 different songs. 
And the songs, like, I actually like the way it flows. Like, I've, I've been on the fence since I started listening to this. And I've been listening to Edmund personally rave to me nonstop that this should be the album that I, like, I don't know if I'm supposed to masturbate to or, like, rub all over my naked flesh or what I'm supposed to do with this. But he keeps raving about this damn album to my ears. And I... <sighs> See, I loved A Perfect Circle since, as I said, about 2006, give or take. I loved them. I loved Tool even before that because I didn't know Perfect Circle existed. I got into Tool about 2004. Uh, That's when I first started really listening to them. I knew of them beforehand. Wasn't really that big into them until 2004. By 2006, I practically had the had the band brand on my forehead because I was listening to them so damn often. I swear to God, their music was literally just floating around me, and everyone around me was just like, "Oh God, he's one of those," and they just would run screaming from me. Which was not good because they had to come to me to have uh, their pictures big, uh, pictures printed because I used to work as a Photoshop, uh, not Photoshop, a photo finishing um, production person where I would just print photos all day. I was the creepy person who watched all of your pictures and saw all the naughty things you people were doing. So anyways, I would listen to this kind of stuff all day. While well, I was, you know, working, when I was at home, that was basically my life back then was listening to tool a perfect circle all that kind of good stuff and i really loved it then this album comes along and i don't know exactly how i feel about it even after having listened to the full album several times my brain keeps popping to certain songs and certain songs feel like a perfect circle like mm-hmm. the second half of disillusioned feels exactly like it should be it's, it sounds exactly like a perfect circle has always sounded to me However, mm. some songs like Eat the Elephant and Get the Let Out and a couple of other songs like that just don't feel right. They feel like someone has given Maynard some very impressive mood-altering substances <laughs> for his psychoses, because I'm sure it was a trained professional, and it feels <laughs> like Maynard has officially kind of lost his way a little bit. Now, I don't say that's necessarily a bad thing, because it's created some rather new, interesting sounds. But it's not the sound I want. That's not the sound I was expecting. It's kind of like if you were to walk into a restaurant and you're like, oh, cool, it's a sandwich shop. And you walk up to the front counter and you ring the bell and the person comes walking over and goes, hi, can I interest you in some lasagna today? And you're like, well, fuck, I wanted a sandwich, but this is lasagna, so it's still good. It's still something I'd enjoy, but I came in for a sandwich and I ended up with lasagna. Fuck, am I upset or am I okay with this? I don't know. I'm stuck in this like weird quandary of going, fuck, I wanted a sandwich, but I have lasagna now. It's still carbs, it's still delicious, and there's still tomatoes involved, but this is not what I asked for. But I'm still pleasantly happy, and I don't know how I feel about this. <laughs> That's how I feel about this, because, I mean, the, the tracks flowed well on my on my end. There's a nice little instrumental that kind of popped up out of fucking nowhere. Mm. Like, it's... It's nice. I, I I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. And I hate having to say that I enjoyed it because I wanted to come into this going, I fucking hated this! But I didn't. I actually enjoyed my way along with this. Some of the tracks don't really match up with the name in my opinion, but that's that's just par for the course. Mm-hmm. Everybody's going to come away from this with a different opinion. And I still feel like I should be mad at them because it's not what I had asked for. But I kind of enjoyed it, and I don't know what's going on. <laughs> Edmund, save me! <laughs> right, from my point of view, I did absolutely love this album. I was, I will admit, very first listen, I was uncertain. I did have myself going, not sure what to think. Then I had a second listen. Started to warm up to it. Third listen... Feeling much stronger f- feelings. And then, fourth listen, I was sort of like, ah, I love this. I don't know why it took me so long to warm up to this, but I love it. Uh, and that's when Edmund found out that he's a perfect circle sexualist. <laughs> he can only now get off to the concept of a perfect circle. <laughs> Trademarked a perfect circle sexualist. <laughs> that was bad. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> it just felt so right, but so wrong at the same time. Oh, dear God. Like, okay. I know there's obviously a lot of symbolism because it's a perfect circle, so it goes hand in hand. Nothing that they've ever done is straightforward. Like, every single song of theirs has always had massive amounts of symbolism. But, how did you feel, mm-hmm. uh, for instance, with Eat the Elephant? How did you feel about 
I mean, it's it's not a very deep song. It's it's pretty much just like the same three or four lines just repeated over and over again. Mm. But going into it, how did you feel about the way that it flows? Like, how did you feel about, like, just off the first track alone, is like a stinger for the rest of the album. I felt it was quite a good, um, very cool, controlled start for the album. It wasn't too in your face, but it was a nice build. And I felt the instrumentation was really well crafted. See, this is what disarmed me when I first got into the album. Mm. I had already kind of got a hint that it was going to be kind of a soft rock album for the most part. Mm. And my brain was just like, this is not who I love. (laughs) This person has betrayed me. Because, I mean, it just starts out so mellow. With the piano and the the soft snare drums and the cymbals and whatnot. It just, it starts out just so slow for a perfect circle. I mean, Maynard's definitely on top form with his singing, which is why it's still definitely enjoyable. It's just, it's not what you want as a perfect circle aficionado. You're like, oh my god, oh crap, the Xanax has finally kicked in after all these years. Why did they do this to my Maynard? You almost want to go over to him and be like, it's okay, you can get off the Xanax and be the creepy, angry little child again. It'll be okay. It'll be okay. As you're rocking yourself back and forth, and he's staring at you wondering why the fuck you're on his lawn. That's kind of how it felt. (laughs) After the craziness that was 2016 and 17, why did you have to start out 2018 on 420 with this? But then it's okay, because then you realize it's just the first song. So then you move on to Disillusioned. Disillusioned is one of those weird tracks that starts out kind of the same way. Mm -hmm. You're like, oh, fuck, it's just going to be the same shit all over again. It's going to be this really soft, mellow rock. How did you feel when it transitioned? I found it to be a bit of a... What? What? What What happened? Where am I? Who am I? Yeah, because I was like, oh, shit, it's just going to be this the whole album. Mm. Because, I mean, it's still a little harder, I guess, in the beginning of the second song, in Disillusion. It still kind of goes like, eh, okay, so we added some guitars in rather than just the piano and the snare drums. Hmm. But it's still really, really soft compared to their usual fare. But then when they have that nice little transition, that's when I, I kind of started to get a boner. I mean, it wasn't a very big one. It wasn't like I had, like, you know, a rager that was ready to start, like, killing small children. But it was it was impressive. I was still excited. That's when I started to fall in love with the album, I think, is when I started to actually hear the change in Disillusioned. Mm. And then from the rest of the album, it's it's actually pretty good. It's just that opening part disarmed me in a way that I was not prepared for, and I'm not okay with this. I still mm. need a hug. Now, I'm going to address this immediately, because otherwise it's going to be, rather ironically, the elephant in the room. Um, but I'm so hungry. Uh, when did I eat it? One of the subjects the album touches upon is grappling with the death of others. Haldell explained that the title track, Eat the Elephant, was written in response to the suicide of two people close to him. The early versions of the song were co-written with Chester Bennington. Yeah, I'd heard that it was originally written for um, Linkin Park. Mm -hmm. And then afterwards... Obviously, they're not going to be using it anytime soon because of the death. So um, at that point, Maynard then took the song and rewrote it Mm. because it obviously wouldn't flow quite the same way, which is why he then rewrote it and then put it together for the album. I did catch catch a bit of wind on that because I was looking up a little information on the album after we had both been listening to it a few times. Mm -hmm. I hadn't fully found out all of that. So that's... That's another layer that I did not know, but that's that's intriguing. I'm, yeah. I'm rather glad that they still co-opted the music that was being written for a friend of theirs. Mm. So um, that's, that's actually quite a nice homage, as yeah. it were. By the way, the tone of my voice when I read out the name, that wasn't intended to imply anything untoward to Chester Bennington. I'm not necessarily a fan of Linkin Park's later work, but that was just personal preference, whatever. It's just one of those, that's a tricky matter to address. Yeah. See, suicide is tough. Mm. doesn't matter whether it's, you know, a Joe Blow down the street to a very famous person you happen to know and love, 
Uh, for instance, the what was originally a controversy until all the facts came out about, say, uh, Robin Williams. Mm. Everyone was so surprised that he had committed suicide until all the facts started coming out and people started realizing the suffering he was going through. Because mm. at first everyone just assumed it was just depression. So there were all kinds of talks about how could a comedian such as he be depressed and, you know, how could he kill himself and, and, and so on until they started to find out that the private hell he had been going through due to... Uh, it was a form of Alzheimer's, and I cannot remember the type of Alzheimer's it is. But where it was, he was essentially... Uh, it was Parkinson's. I thought it was Alzheimer's. No, I'm pretty sure it was Parkinson's. Uh, let me just... Uh, dementia with, of, with Lou's body. Oh, Louis bodies. That's it. Yeah. It was dementia. So he was suffering... I, I don't know why my brain just went to Alzheimer's, but he, was a, he had a form of dementia where he was starting to dissociate the world around him, mm. and it was just his own private hell. No one around him understood what was going on, and it's a type of dementia that does not really show any like physical symptoms that are easily found unless you dissect the brain, which is typically difficult to do when the person's alive. Yeah. So because, of, <laughs> because of the way that he died, um, they were able to then inspect him and then find out what was going on. And what was originally viewed to be just depression turned out to be something far worse. Mm. So because of that, everyone was shocked and surprised. And we started talking about mental health for a short period of time. But then we stopped because that's just what we do as a society is anytime we start talking about mental health, it all just kind of comes crashing down because no one wants to properly address it. So and and hooray. Welcome to Music Geekery, where we talk about suicide. Anyways, so like talking about depression and sadness kind of goes hand in hand with a perfect circle mm. because they never really like to talk about happy joyful things like you'll never really hear maynard go out on stage and start singing about his favorite lollipop when he was five <laughs> I, I doubt that would ever be an album a musical styling that he would ever try he always likes to target things that are full of i don't want to say controversy but at least there there's something that you need to think about because it's a human thing whether it's sadness or drug addiction or loss or grief so the fact that he brought this album out and he's trying to tackle things and he's not doing it in his usual growling manner you know because when he usually goes up on stage it's usually angry guitar riffs and you know symbolism of suffering and pain and so yeah. on but instead it's kind of just very very light and hard, like light and upbeat in a very creepy way. I guess that is kind of mannered. So it's... I'm actually a little more impressed with the album than I was before I even started talking about it today. What the hell's happening? Well, I, I suppose the best description is Consequence of Sound described the album as angry and mellow, successfully capturing the emotion of angry and tired of being angry at the same time, which is kind of the impression you get from the album that is just... There's this dull growl that's sort of like, I am so fed up with all of this, even being fed up of it. Yeah. <sighs> what a mess. So, basically, if you want to know if this album's worth listening to or not, it's pretty simple. If you're looking for the old, angry, growling, mean, nasty-sounding, Tool-esque, but in much more condensed form that is a perfect circle from, like, circa 2000 to 2006, this is not your album. Nah. This is not what you're walking into. If you're looking for something intriguing, different, lighthearted, but also pretty heavy, this is your album. Mm. And as a fan of the old, I can say it's really difficult to get into initially. But after you've spent a little bit of time with it, it grows on you and kind of like a creepy fungus. Kind of like Edmund. <laughs> hey! kind of like Edmund. Basically, it's Edmund in music form. No, I, I kid, I kid. But it basically is. It is something that kind of grows on you the more you listen to it. The first couple tracks are difficult, and there are some tracks I don't understand the naming to. Like, So Long and Thanks for All the Fish has absolutely nothing to do with Douglas Adam at all. It's just weird. I don't know why they did that. I can't Anyways. explain that. I don't think you can. I don't can, lie. because... Lies. Well, you're aware of the whole concept behind So Long and Thanks for All the Fish, aren't you? What, the the, the actual song, or what? Like uh, the original one, or what? I'm talking about the just the basic message, because fuck the song, fuck that film, fuck it in the ass. Hey, 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 hey. No, 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 hey, no, hey, no, hey, no. 
Come on. C- come on. No. Give me a hug. No. Give me a hug. It's okay. Bring it in. No. Bring it in. It's okay. You will no. live. It's okay. No. <laughs> <laughs> the movie wasn't as bad as he's trying to make it out to be. It wasn't amazing, but it wasn't as bad as he's trying to make it out to be. <laughs> no, it was worse. No, it's not. We're getting off traffic, off topic, but it's still true. It wasn't that bad. No, but, it was yeah, worse. Yeah, I do understand the message. I do understand the message, Mr. <laughs> Spastastic. <laughs> Anyway, um, well, the whole idea is that the dolphins would, if they could, they would look at all the stupidity and insanity that's going on in the world and go, you know what, fuck it, and just leave. That's why they've utilised the So Long and Thanks for All the Fish title, because they're basically framing it as though if the dolphins had a choice in the matter, they would just go, yeah, fuck this. Well, that and all the shit that we're pumping into the ocean, including all those nice little uh, water beads, but that's beside the Mm. point. Yeah. Trash Um, Island is awesome. Population one, Al Gore. Anyways, (laughs) so how do you want to end this? Um, well, final thoughts on the album in terms of best track, worst track, what you might have just outright cut, you know, even if you did like the song, that sort of thing. See, I don't really feel like there needs to be much change to this album. I do actually enjoy it. I'm not entirely sure if I'm kind of cool with the way it opens, Mm -hmm. but I don't know if I'd move anything. I think I would just have to just leave it as is, because, I mean, it disarms you with the first track, because you're like, oh, it's a perfect circle. What's the first track going to sound like? And you're like, oh, fuck, I just spent 20 bucks on this, or what have you. (laughs) That might, that might, I don't know if I'd leave Eat the Elephant at the beginning, but the problem is, what the fuck would you put in its place? Yeah, I, I can't think of anything you could really open the album with, aside from Eat the Elephant. So, yeah, I mean, if you started out with Disillusioned, and like left, left uh, eat, the elef- eat the Elephant and put it like at the last? It, it wouldn't work uh, that way. It wouldn't really flow after, no. yeah, it wouldn't flow after Get the I mean, Let the Out. Thing, so no, you have to yeah. leave it at the I beginning. Mean, the only thing that I might, um, I would possibly cut Hourglass... Because I find, I do like that song, but it feels very weird in context with everything else on the album. Actually, you know, there is one song I would cut because it's a fucking remix of their old song, and that is Buying Down the River. Yeah. That... Why they decided to include that, I'll never understand. I mean, that feels very out of place because it's from the previous album. So it's sort of like... And can we cut this? You desperately want to pay for a song you've already purchased yet again. Which, by the way, is a staple that happens quite often with a perfect circle. Uh, They do that shit to you a lot, actually. I'll have to take your word for it. I've not listened to them enough to comment. (sighs) This kind of goes back into just headaches of headaches. Mm -hmm. After they released their first album and their second album and then their remix of Everything Under the Sun album, which technically is the third album. Oh, A Motive. Yeah, and then then they released a collection of the previous three works, but they also included a brand new song in it. Now, most artists would let you purchase songs individually, so you could actually just purchase the new song, say, on iTunes. They blocked you from doing that. Now, I don't think it was the artist. I think it was the record label who, t- who made that decision. Yeah. So you get access to the brand new song. You had to purchase the entire album. So once again, I think that was the record label who chose to do that. But it was still really douchey. Mm. Really douchey. And it was a massive headache because you're like, but I've already bought all three of the albums that already existed. And I already own them all. Why do I have to buy this again? Oh, I know. Because the fucking record label wants more money, and they think they can squeeze it out of me, the listener. Mm. Well, they're fucking right, because I bought it. <laughs> uh, but yeah, Joke's on me! <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I think buying down the river, I'd cut because it just, it's sort of like, why is this here? And the original that they did is far better. Mm. Yeah, I listened it's, through it's... the original before we did the recording, and yeah, it's much better the original recording and hourglass i'd cut 
I wouldn't say that it should be left to the cutting room floor. Hourglass is a decent song in its own right. I do like it, but I feel it should have just been released as a one-off single or video on YouTube, something like that, because it feels very out of place sound-wise with the well, rest of... Because it's basically Fall Out Boy. Yeah. It's Fall Out Boy, brought to you by A Perfect Circle. <laughs> it's, it is a weird track. Yeah. Yeah, it's sort of like the weird vocal effects, the techno sounds. I think what's going All on that's... is Maynard's just like, you know, my old style, it's kind of old. Kind of like oh, I'm getting kind of old. What are these youngsters into these days? You know, it's kind of like that Steve Buscemi gif that's been floating around forever <laughs> of like, you know, where he's wearing the t-shirt that just says rock band. And then like, you know, he's got the he's got the skateboard yeah. slung over his shoulder. He's like... Hello, fellow kids. That's kind of what that track feels like. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's not bad. It's just, you can tell he's trying desperately to try to get more of an audience, mm. I guess. Which, I mean, more power to him if he can pull it off. I just don't personally like the track. It's, mm. it's yeah. DLB is another really interesting one. Yeah. And that's the music. That's just the, the instrumental track that mm. comes out of, like, left field. And the whole time you're just like, so w what's going to happen? Is there anything that's going to happen here? And then nothing ever really does. I think that's one of the other reasons why I'd cut Hourglass, because DLB would flow quite nicely into Feathers. Yeah. But when you go from DLB to Hourglass, it's sort of like, that felt really jarring. And then you have the final song, which apparently, depending on your political aspirations, can mean drastically different things. I mean... The intention of their political leadings, they are left-wing. There's no two ways about it. I mean... You're saying that they're liberal? <gasps> you would have never guessed that by their constant views about, you know, drug abuse prevention and, uh, and trying to seek help and whatnot. You never would have guessed that they were liberal, not conservative. There's no way. But I will admit, while listening to Get the Let Out, I swear to God, I kept hearing him reference Trump. After looking at the lyrics... It's not in there, so apparently I'm hearing it over and over again. But just be warned that you will, you will hear things that are not in the song when you're listening, especially if you're not listening 100% close, because you will hear things that are not in the song. Yeah, and, well, it's not the only song that is actually in relation to gun control and all that sort of thing. Because that and, um, oh, which one was it? Uh, Talk Talk. Both of those are um, different approaches to the gun control situation. Talk Talk is with regards to American Christianity's stance on gun control, where it's sort of like they'll offer thoughts and prayers and all that sort of thing. Yeah. Let's not get into gun control in this episode, otherwise no. this episode will be 48 hours long and everyone will either love or hate us. And while I, do, I don't mind necessarily a divisive episode, let's not make it that divisive episode. Let's do that in a different one, shall we? Yeah. Because that sounds like that's an episode that will take way too long to edit and then we'll end up just looking like either Cretans or Amazing or both, and I don't think we're ready for that quite yet. Mm. Oh, just a quick thing so the onus is off of our backs. This is the interpretation confirmed by Maynard. He himself said that that is the interpretation that the song is meant to have. So I'm just saying what he said. Yes, I am a liberal, but... <laughs> well, you're also a British liberal, and obviously as a British liberal, you're barely even in our centre. You're like a central Democrat over here. That's all you are. You're like not even as good as us liberals over here in California. So could you fucking step back, bitch? Because you don't belong here. You belong over there across the pond. So how is that for my for my Californian voice? Well, your valley girl impression. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Um, yeah, we kind of agreed with what song we liked the least on the album, which would be Hourglass. And it's just because Fall Out Boy doesn't belong in my perfect circle. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it sounds like better Fall Out Boy, so I'll give it that, but it still sounds kind of Fall Out Boy-ish. I refuse to state anything about my preferences or disagreements about Fall Out Boy. 
because I don't want fangirls to chew me in half and eat my <laughs> eat my soul. So I will just nod and smile and go, exactly, Edmund, and not say a damn word. Oh, I'm going to say it. Fallout boys suck. See, I won't go that far. They actually have a track or two I genuinely like. Oh, I enjoy a couple of tracks of theirs too, but I'm still going to say they suck. <laughs> Come at me! Oh, Jesus Christ. There's gonna be one little girl with like a with like a pencil sharpener in one hand, and she's gonna have like a protractor in the other, and she's gonna run at you screaming, and then somehow she's actually gonna be more dangerous than anybody else you've ever met. And that's what that's how that's how Edmund's gonna die, is it's gonna be a little girl with a protractor and a pencil sharpener, and she's gonna somehow kill Edmund in the streets. What All because of the statement. Someone... How would you kill someone with a protractor? Like a compass I could get, but protractor? Uh, maybe she spent a lot of time making it into like a prison <laughs> shiv. I don't know. Just, it's going to happen to you now. It's, it's been ordained. <laughs> Which means I will own this channel soon. <laughs> It'll be mine. You don't even have the password, dude. Um. Um. <laughs> that doesn't matter. I'll. I'll. I'll fly to England and... I don't know. <laughs> so many hey. steps to be required for that. Uh, what a day. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh. this episode is already overrun for like 11 minutes or so. Uh, <laughs> I'll edit it point. down enough. I know, you're going to take all my fun jokes out, so instead we're going to be all dry and depressing, talking about how gun control is important and how you're not a liberal Democrat, and, you know, all that kind of thing. Anyway, um, score out of five. Ooh. As an old school Perfect Circle fan, I would label this about a two and a half. But, right. but if you weigh it not as an old school a Perfect Circle album, this definitely is like a four and a half out of five. Mm. It's damn good. It's just not, if you're, if you're looking for old school Perfect Circle, you're going to be like, this is not what I came for. And you'll just walk out. Yeah. Um, I would say, as a Perfect Circle album, old school wise, I'd give it a three, and then say four and a half as an album in its own right, because it's, I really do love the album. I was contemplating giving it a five out of five, but Hourglass and the fact that they repeated a song from a previous album did <laughs> put the score down ever so slightly. So you're putting it at what, like a 7.5 out of 5? <laughs> <laughs> well, you were you were acting like you this was the best thing you ever heard in your life and like I can pull up no, I can pull I will, up messages. I can do that. Well, I will admit I was considering it a 6 out of 5 in at one point and then I gave it another re-listen and it was sort of like no, I can't commit to that. That is talking too hyperbolically. It's a really good album, but it's not that good. Because six out of five is when I'm breaking the scale and saying there is absolutely nothing I would change about this album. Nor will there ever be another album that's good. That's that's the other part of that. Mm. This is why you should never ever label anything as a ten, in a, like a ten out of ten or a five out of five, unless you are absolutely sure that this is the pinnacle of awesome and nothing can ever be that good. Well, I don't regard it as nothing will ever be as good. I just regard it as this is so amazing that I wouldn't change anything. I wouldn't cut anything. Everything's in the right order. It's just they captured lightning in a bottle in this instance. That is what 6 out of 5 is representative of. But obviously they didn't capture lightning in a bottle for this album. I like how he walked back his previous statements he made me read privately. Anyway. <laughs> that's it for this episode. Next episode, well, it'll be one of two things. I'll either find something in the interim, it'll probably be just as well too. Uh, then again, seeing as, uh, Billy, you are my current single soul Patreon, so... <gasps> Ooh, I am the person who's bankrolling him. And I can't afford it, so someone has to take the pressure off. <laughs> so Someone help me. So if you feel like picking an album to review between this and the Shinedown review, which is the next scheduled one, then have at it. <laughs>
<laughs> just preferably, <laughs> preferably a band I've never listened to before. See, that's difficult, Mister Music Cr- Music Critic. You kind of listen to everything, but I think I can find something inside the vaults of my mind. I'm sure you'll find something. I mean, I never heard of Blue October, so. Yeah, and see, I was going to talk about them, but it just doesn't feel right. Now that mm. I've actually kind of mulled this over, it doesn't feel right. I will save my, my views and what's happened to Blue October and the lead singer another time. Like, we might do like a kind of like just a like an interim review at some point when we're both bored to, ter- bored to tears of all the options. Mm. We might just have a sit down and we talk about why you should never meet your heroes kind of thing. Oh, Lord. Because that's kind of what happened, basically, is I got to meet kind of my hero of a, of a musician and I was extremely displeased with what took place. So ah. at some point we might sit down and talk about that. I'm not too terribly worried about it right this second. So anyways, yeah. Um, yeah, we might just do, we might do a sit down at some point and kind of just talk about uh, why you never meet your heroes, that kind of thing. And they kind of go over it because I got to meet the, the band and whatnot kind of. And I found out that I didn't need to meet the hero because it changed my world perspective on a lot of things, and I'm not very happy with what happened. Anyways, mm. that's another another story for another time. Mm. Anyway, <sighs> that's it for this episode. Catch you next time, whenever that is. It'll be sometime between now and the tricentennial of the United States. S- Hopefully, nowhere near that long, because I don't want to be alive another... 50, 59 years. I don't want to be alive for another 59 years. That's, that seems like way too long. So <laughs> catch you guys hopefully in the next week or two. Uh, look forward to possibly the review of what was happening on Channel Awesome before or after this. I'm not sure when this is all going up, but we'll see you then if we haven't already. Sayonara! This has been Billy the Dumbass or otherwise known as the One True Mouse. And this has been Edmund, also known as Drehawk and Sugar Tits. I was going to say Sugar Tits, but you beat me to it. (laughs) If you haven't understood what the joke is, you never will. We'll talk to you guys another time. And thank you. And so long. And thanks for all the fish. (laughs) Good night, everybody.